being relatively easy to get to, the Gambia has for long been a favoured destination for those seeking their first taste of West African birding. Surrounded by Senegal, apart from its Atlantic coastline, the country basically sits around the floodplain of the Gambia River. Arriving in the capital Banjul, we were quickly transferred to the Farakunku Lodges, our base for the next two weeks of our trip. The lodges are run by a British and Gambian couple, Heather and Moses Fatty, and sit within their own compound near Tujering, close to the west coast. The lodge grounds were good for locally common species, such as common bulbul. Bronze mannequin. Often visiting the water bowls in family parties. With juveniles seemingly numerous at this time of year. Sometimes joined by lavender waxbills. Village weaver. This is a female. Red billed firefinch. Here a singing male. Red eyed dove, the largest of the collared type doves in the Gambia. And laughing doves. Quieter areas attracted less expected visitors, like this trio of black cap babblers. An adult male beautiful sunbird, along with this immature male. An iridescent male splendid sunbird. and a bronze-tailed glossy starling coming to drink at one of the water bowls. In the afternoon, the area around the swimming pool famously attracts little bee-eaters. Ring-necked parakeets were regularly seen by a nest hole in one of the few remaining large trees around the lodges. Females have an all-green head, whereas the male has a black chin that curves up before fading into a pink-tinged collar, giving this species its alternative name of rose-ringed parakeet. Senegal parrots preferred a rotten palm tree. They were often seen seemingly prospecting around potential nest holes, not always amicably. Both sexes share the same attractive grey, green and yellow plumage. Around the lodges, various trails lead through the local environment. Unfortunately, the forest that was here when the lodges were first built has been replaced by cultivated fields and small settlements. But there's still plenty of bird life around. Yellow-billed shrikes in particular enjoyed these more open habitats. as did Senegal Kukuls. Despite the name, they are widespread south of the Sahara. 
western red-billed hornbills were also common. Scrubby areas produced tawny flanked prinias. This worn adult was carrying food. Grey backed Camaroptera. This skulking red winged warbler. And more of the appropriately named beautiful sunbirds. Only the male sports the iridescent plumage and long tail streamers. A pearl-spotted owlet could often be found perched on the front of its favourite palm tree. And little bee-eaters staked out overgrown fields. They may be the smallest member of their family, but retain that typical bee-eater charisma. With luck, superb blue-bellied rollers could be approached relatively closely. Lizard buzzards were typically more wary. This is another species that has adapted well to increased cultivation, here using cut palm fronds as a perch. Vinaceous doves often perched on overhead wires. Various flocks of finches and weavers were regularly encountered, the commonest being village weavers. along with red-cheeked cordon bleus. Only the males have the distinctive red patch across the ear coverts. On females, the ear coverts match the pale blue of the underparts. Red-billed firefinches often fed alongside the cordon bleus. A red rump and laws identify this as a female. Whereas the obvious development of red across the head, along with a bright yellow eye ring, show this to be an immature male. Northern grey-headed sparrows sometimes joined in. Where there were red-billed firefinches, there were often village indigo birds, as this is a brood parasite of that species. Juveniles are the ultimate brown job, with virtually no distinguishing features. There were also plenty of northern red bishops, the males by now molting out of their breeding plumage. Females and juveniles look alike and are hard to distinguish from other similar species, but tend to be smaller and generally plainer. As the sun set below the horizon, exploring these same tracks one evening revealed this African scops owl. Early mornings and evenings were the best time of day to visit the small nature garden that Heather and Moses have developed close to the lodges. A variety of native trees attract a remarkable range of birds. Western plantain eaters were particularly easy to see here. They are abundant in the Gambia but not always so approachable. Their diet consists mainly of fruits, but they also eat leaves. This one seemed to be ingesting pieces of shell from the path, 
presumably to help with the digestion of a recent leaf-based meal. They are members of the Turaco family, but this and the eastern species are the only members of their genus. Both were formerly treated as a single species, but nowadays these western birds have been separated from the eastern by the lack of white in the tail, spotted rather than scalloped markings on the upper parts, and streaking on the belly. Other common species regularly seen in the garden included Senegal Kukul. African Thrush, always wary and best seen around the water bowls. Forktail Drongo, Brown babbler, usually found in small noisy groups, however this was a pair collecting nesting material. And family parties of green wood hoopoos. Another sociable species almost always seen in flocks. Juveniles lack the glossy sheen of the adults and show a brownish mottled throat. They also have dark bill and legs, all of which are red on adults. Payapiaks were another gregarious visitor. The call of these long-tailed crows is supposedly onomatopoeic, but most calls are a single syllable. As with many sociable species, they are quite charismatic, and were particularly entertaining whenever they came down to the water bowls. A pair of fine spotted woodpeckers occasionally put in an appearance, sometimes coming to feed on the ground. The sexes are similar and share the fine spots across the underparts from where they get their English name. Where they differ is that the males have an all red crown, whereas on the females the forehead is black, heavily flecked with white. A wintering willow warbler could usually be found foraging at the end of the garden. There were also more little Senegal parrots. And red-eyed doves. When seen well, the dark red eye with a slightly paler orbital ring is distinctive. The smaller vinaceous dove has a dark eye and white in the tail, visible here when stretching.
black-billed wood doves are even smaller. As the name suggests, the all-black bill is an easy means to separate them from blue-spotted wood doves. The stunning yellow-crowned gonolek is far more often heard than seen, so to find one occasionally visiting the garden was very satisfying. It even spent some time preening in the open. Other less frequent visitors included white-billed buffalo weavers. There were no males, just a few females, and mostly juveniles, which are basically blackish-brown, often with mottled underparts. Plus yellow-throated leaf loves. They are either the only member of their genus or share that status with the split pale-throated leaf love, depending on what taxonomy is used. African bird names can be confusing as they are not actually closely related to the true leaf love, although all are types of bulbul. A surprise one morning was the discovery of a hooded vulture roosting in one of the trees. These are the smallest and by far the commonest vulture in the Gambia. A relatively thin bill allows them to feed on smaller items. They are generally more omnivorous than the larger vultures. The vulture was however no threat to the gardens of the bird life. Unlike this juvenile shikra which often arrived late afternoon and clearly recognised good feeding opportunities here. 